Hello and welcome to Raw Chatter. I am your host speaking, Vicky Midwood, health coach. And today I have got with me yet another male guest. We're doing well actually on this season in that we have not got all female guests. So I'm delighted to introduce you to somebody who actually I came across via a friend of mine who started out in the world of health and wellness, actually pursuing his passion, which some of you may think of as being very glamorous. Luke was a footballer. But his life took a change and he is now working in his own company, which he has set up called Muscle Coach. And he's got an amazing program, which is Master Your Life. Luke has got an inspiring, uh, uh, an interesting and at some points uh, kind of pulling at your heartstrings tale to share with us. So I do hope that you enjoy Luke and all he has to tell us about how he now does what he does and why he chose to be a coach. So Luke, over to you. That was a great intro, Vicky, by the way. I love that. And the fact that you've got male guests on here as well, I think that's really good. I'm kind of the same with the podcast, bringing on female guests. But yeah, we'll we'll talk about that after. But just, <laughs> just in terms of where, where to kind of start with this, um, I think depth's really important because let's all be honest in the world that we live in today it's quite easy to hit the shiny it's kind of easy to let people know what's going well in our life but it's really mm -hmm. hard to be vulnerable maybe open up i'm talking from a male perspective you know i was the typical and i think it comes from you know the generation of my dad being very closed off be the man mm -hmm. you know you've got this and and with football uh, being my profession, and, and this was actually 16 years of my life. But if I go back to when I was a, a child, because I think that's always a good place to start, I yeah. enjoyed my I enjoyed my football. So right. my dad, my dad always put me in places where Luke go and have fun. It kept me away from actually the academies. I was actually starting to get scouted. I was oh, really? getting yeah, I was I was starting to get picked up as like, oh, this guy's got a good left foot. He's he's strong. He's he's powerful. And and I had. I had opportunities and I did explore those opportunities, but he, he tried to keep me in the, the local football game, winning trophies, having fun, being around, you know, a good group of boys. Cause at the time we really did have a good group of lads playing together. And then the dads always have drinks after. So there was, there was good banter, good yeah. environment. And actually we'd go to Germany once per year. So we traveled together. So there was a lot of fun. Yeah. There was a lot of fun things and opportunities. So I think it was one of those things where, you know, I guess my dad was always kind of looking out for me and thinking, is this something that I want to cut off for my son at the age of eight, nine, 10, 11? It was always kind of coming around and, and, he, and he just, nah, just I'll let him enjoy it a little bit more. My dad was into coaching as well. So okay. he, he really? took the teams and yeah, we always did extra training. We'd go out in the park till it was dark at night. I, I would literally be <laughs> playing football, you name it pretty much every single day for as long as possible. I loved it. And I think, you know, when it becomes an obsession like that, it, it obviously shows that you enjoy it. And that for me was in a summary, my childhood with Brilliant. football up until I'd say the age of 13, when you're getting into your teenage years, you know, you're starting to have more distractions, I guess, with, um, you know, females and yeah. <laughs> it's getting a bit more, you know, serious in maybe relate. Well, not, I wouldn't say deadly serious, but relationships seem a bit more of a thing. Yeah. Part, part is at school, you know, it, you're getting all these things starting to happen. And I think that's when my dad started to think, right, it's probably time now to, to put Luke, my son, in a professional environment. And I think that's right. where that started to go. That was pretty, I mean, in, when you look now back at how he handled that, actually, that was really quite forward thinking, wasn't it? For him to keep you grounded and enjoying it, because I think you may have come across people, and I'm sure you'll share with us, while you were actually playing professionally, who did go the academy route. And that was hard and can be hard right from the get go. So your dad was pretty clever uh, on making sure that you were still enjoying it and it was fun and there wasn't the pressure too early on, wasn't he? Yeah, a hundred percent, and that's why I wanted to start with that because yeah. I guess at the time I was wanting to be in a professional environment <laughs> as a young kid, like anybody would be. You know, you see football now and Sky Sports, you see these young players coming through. I mean, obviously, there's so much more money in it now, pressure, mm -hmm. uh, accessibility with social media, and it wasn't so much of a big thing then in terms of like social media and making everything look so yeah. fancy. So I 
you know, now look at it and uh, I'm grateful. And I've even said to my dad as well, when we talk about football, going back to those days, I'm always like, you know, I'm so glad that you didn't push me into an academy at that age, because I'll always remember those good times. And those good times, if I'm being really honest, Vicky, was when I played for fun. As soon, and, and, and I know people would have had great experiences in the professional game. and But for me, I didn't, I did have good times, but majority of it, it just didn't be what I wanted it to be. And I think that's an important point to make. And I think there have been a number of studies now where they've looked at people who have a hobby and they're really good at it and they're passionate and they're obsessive about it and they really enjoy it. And then if they decide to monetize it because somebody suggested it's a good idea. Now, suddenly that hobby is something that you have to do that they just kind of fall out of love with it because it's changed the whole dynamic of of their enjoyment and what they got from it in the first place. So you decided, well, your dad decided that now is a good time for you to take it more professional. So at age 13, is that what you did? Yeah, so I actually had multiple trials at clubs. I do agree with what you're saying, that there's a lot of influence from outside of opinions and maybe you feel like you may miss out on this opportunity because let's be honest, opportunities come and go. Sometimes we can look and go, I wish I'd have taken that that time. Then there's other moments where you're like, I'm so glad I've taken it now, even though maybe I didn't feel ready. So for me, I was more than ready for, mm-hmm. for a professional environment. I looked at myself, I was like, I want to be this pro footballer. Everybody at school, you know, when I was playing school football, I was just playing football, 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 you know, Saturday, Sundays, and everybody's like, Luke's going to be this professional footballer. That did, however, though, did weigh on me a lot. I did start to feel pressure with that. I was enjoying it. I was obviously getting noticed. Then I signed for Rotherham United in the under-14 season. And I was always playing, I was always playing the year up. So, you know, I was always getting right. noticed, like play with the boys or the men, you know, the people that have grown up. So for me, I was mature in terms of my mindset. I won't say I was mature in like my growth stage. <laughs> uh, I was a late developer, should we say, but uh, yeah, there was always nudging me. There was always saying, oh, let's let's put Luke in this deep end. Let, let's test him a little bit. And then at the age of 16, I'd done my couple of years. And then what they have is a youth scholarship program. So what yeah. that is then is it's more like a, a full time program alongside with education. So there's a good element there to give you a gateway out if you are not to you know, land a professional contract. So right. that's like a, that's like sports science. So you can go on to do like diplomas mm-hmm. and then do towards degrees for me. I wasn't, I'll be honest, too interested in the education part, even though I, I, I do like personal development now more than anything. But all I thought at the moment was like, I just want football. I just want to be a pro footballer. That's all I want. And I signed at Rotherham. And just to give you context, because a lot of people, I think, in football, they look at the the glory of, oh, there's loads of money in football. Well, mm. I was earning £55 a week. Wow. Wow. So people will be quite shocked at that, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's yeah. not, you know, I mean, I don't want it to be a, this podcast to be around the money side, but I think we, we, we sometimes, you know, for me as well, being like putting all this time in, I mean, the hours and just the stuff behind the scenes that people don't see, like the practicing hours, the investment made to then, you know, be given this opportunity to work towards a pro contract and somebody to say to you, yeah, it's only 55 pounds a week. It was never about the money. It yeah. couldn't be about the money yeah. because my yeah. friend, my friends, some of them gone into trades. So they didn't go because I know now at school you have to stay until you're 18. But at the time, 16, you could leave and go into a trade. Some of them was earning, yeah. you know, 250, 300 pounds a week. And there's me and Luke, you know, they, they're looking at me and going, oh, Luke, you're this pro football. You must be coining it. In. And I'm <laughs> like, listen, no, I'm on like 55 pounds a week. Oh, really? I'm like, yeah. But that's so that says so much about the perception of what we think versus the reality of what actually goes on, doesn't it? And and obviously, as you said, there's not the social media around it now, but things won't be massively different. No, I think as well. With social media, I mean, I, I guess football now and I guess lads that I mean, if there's anybody that ever listens to this, that's got kids, nephews that are going through academy, they'd probably be getting paid a lot more now, I guess. I mean, we're going back what? Yeah, 14 years ago, Matt. Um, so for me, it was, I'll tell you what I did like about it though, Vicky, is the fact that it grounded me. So you, you, you started to understand money because when you had your payday, you was paid monthly anyway. So it was like, what? Like not even 300 pounds, like 200 and yeah. Something. 40, 30 pounds or something like that so it's not really much to get you by my dad had to support me financially as well because obviously you know i can't live on that let's be real so he was always supporting me there there's a lot of money and time that comes in you know from the parents support as well and i'm always going to be forever grateful for for my mum and dad and even through those years um 
as I was in academy, obviously Rotherham United, three months in, I actually quit. No. Wow. Yeah. Tell us yeah. More. Yeah. So um, I thought when I signed that pen to paper for two years, I was like, this is it. You know, I'm going to make it. I'm, I'm on my way. Dream. And the guy who signed me on as well, I, I loved him. He was such a great coach. But when I went into the, the scholarship program where my job and my reality now was football every single day, there was a different manager. And if I'm being frankly honest, I hated his guts. Wow. Um, he never listened. It was very old school. So I'm quite a sensitive guy and I'm, I am, I am emotional. Uh, I have got an emotional side and I think it just, it was very blank. It was very, you know, no emotion on the face. And I was asking a lot of questions and I'll never forget one day after a football training session, the lads turned around to me and said, Luke, are you thick? So I was well, like, I was like, what? And there's like, you're asking so many questions. Will you just shut the up? You, yeah. And th that then I stopped. It, it put me in my shell. I, I never asked a question again. I hid. I suffered. I held it in. In the football, they, they knew it was getting to me. So guess what they do? As boys in the change room, they play on it more. And actually, Vicky, at this moment in time, I was actually, I struggled being in a change room with my top off. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had, I had, I mean, I know people talk about body dysmorphia now. I would definitely say maybe I had elements of that. I didn't know what that meant at the time. Yeah. But I would, I would be in the change rooms and I, I'd cover up a little bit. And I, I wasn't fat. You know, I was, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't shredded. I'm not like looking at myself like a six pack Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to look like that and like a David Beckham at the time. But, you know, I was, I was shy. And, and I think as well, they played on that and they bantered me. They, they got me in a corner and tried, you know, taking the towel away from me and stuff like that. Mm. And, and it, it was hard, trust me. I mean, to try and not cry and burst out in tears because it was anger. It wasn't just... Right. I felt quite lonely. I felt pushed in a corner. I mean, I had moments where they were joking with us and they were fun, but they... they played. Yeah, but this the, the thing is, is this is this is the male stuff. I mean, it's it's kind of an initiation in a way that they are testing you to see if you can deal with it. And unfortunately, I couldn't deal with it. I'd come from a school of friends. I'd come from a family that was always supportive and there was always friendly people and there was a lot of positivity there. And then this was right. the first, first time that I was accustomed to a lot of negativity. I mean, just to go further, they saw opportunity because they knew, I mean, I love food and, you know, I was... I was obsessed with food even then. They would go as far as like putting coffee granules in my food. So they'd ruin my meal. And then they, so I'd have to throw it in the bin so I wouldn't have any food and I'd be starving. So this is stuff that, again, you'd think, why would I do that? And, and you can laugh at it now, but you know, at the time, it's not funny. It's really, really like it grinds you. But this is, this is the stuff that if you don't say anything, you have to somehow learn to handle it. And you're not sure because you don't have the tool set to handle it. But if you do anything, if you do say anything, you know it's going to get worse because they'll know that you've said something. So you're leaving yourself wide open, which means you're kind of stuck in a rock between a rock and a hard place, aren't you? And this is what I think a lot of people will be able to resonate if they've been bullied in any way, shape or form, whether it's at school, whether it's at university, whether it's in something like this, a sporting environment or even in a workplace, because it, it still goes on in office spaces and this is something that I think is is powerful because the very fact that you still it affects you going to a changing room and taking your top off now says how powerful that is all these years later. Yeah, it's and again, like people would say, Luke, I don't, I don't understand. Like you're in great shape. But it's one of those things that. All right, I mean, I would say now I am confident in my own image. I'm not, I, you know, I do feel good about myself. There's still elements of that in the back of my mind. There's a little bit of trauma, if you want to say, just where I feel that element of oh, oh, what people may think of me or with my top off. But I think what kept me in that hard place, though, Vicky, where holding myself back was, as I said before, the manager, he didn't want to listen. Yeah. So there wasn't a safe space and an open door for me to go and have a, a bit of an emotional conversation with. So... The only person I could was my dad. My dad yeah. couldn't change the situation. If I had said to any of the lads, boys, can you stop putting... And I did. I said, can you just stop putting coffee granules in? And what are they going to do? They're going to put more in. Yeah. Like, it's Because yeah. it, they, they find it funny. That's That that was the level of mindset. The mentality, right? that, yeah. That was amazing. You know, they put, they put DP in your boxer shorts so your balls would be on fire. You know... <laughs> They'd put shower gel in your trainers. They'd slit your, your boxer shorts so, you, you know, your willy would hang out. And, I mean, it, 
I look at it and it is a bit of fun, obviously, if there's light-heartedness behind it, but I genuinely felt a target. And and it was only because I wasn't dealing with it. And the thing is, is because I felt quite trapped and alone. So what I did was I thought, you know what, I can't go through with this for another 18 months or so, or what, 20 odd months. I'm I'm out. And for me, it's not worth the money, it's not worth the stress. And you know, I, I was I, br- I broke down in tears on the phone to my dad, and it was the first time he's ever heard me cry and be so low in my, ever in my footballing career. Whoa, he must have been heartbroken and devastated for you. Yeah, I mean, it, it would. He, he knows this, and I actually spoke at our conference earlier this year, and again, I shared stuff in that story about my footballing days, and he sat there with my mom. And they had said, because they had a conversation after and went, how, how did we not know about this on this this level? Like this re-? And my dad said to me, he says, Luke, you know, if I'd have known about that at the time, I'd have come up and drove, pick you up and you'd have come home, mate, and you'd gone back playing local football. Like, what's the point? Kind of thing. Like, he, he obviously wanted to put that arm around me and say, son, it's OK. But yeah. I said to him, I said, the thing is, for me, obviously, I didn't want to let him down. It's yeah. what I wanted to do. And I also wanted to fight my demons. I didn't want it to be where just because I had a little bit of resistance or somebody coming in my face and giving me this shit, basically, yeah. that I was just going to back down and be this. But I did pull away and I gave up and I, I ended it. As in, I was like, I'm, I can't deal with somebody who don't want to listen to me. Yeah. So I got out of the contract and basically I went back home and... I was like, right, okay, so what next? And yeah. my dad, my dad kind of helped me out. He, he rang up a few contacts, and yeah, he had somebody that he knew through his coaching days at Berry FC. So Berry FC is or right. Berry Town, yeah, it's near Manchester. Yeah. yeah. Um, he contacted him, and he just he just basically said, look, we haven't got money to take on anybody else this year, but if your loot wants to come up, then he's more than welcome to. Then at that time, that was an option. And then Derby County, they said, yeah, bring him in for a week's trial. See, We'll see what he's like. We're happy to have a look. So I went to Derby first because obviously that was closer to home. Yeah. Um, that's because obviously I was living like Mansfield way at the time. And I went there and honestly, I was well out of my depth. I mean, I walked into the changing rooms and I'd never seen such a professional environment where, you know, everything was laid out clean for you. You had protein shakes. Wow. All the lads, all the lads there had all the foam rollers out. It was, it was like a, a chalk I mean, and cheese. Yeah, we was training at like a college, and there were cages everywhere with lockers and stuff like. That. It was, it was just a, and, and I already felt under pressure. And then right. when I went out on the training field the first day, I felt like a headless chicken. I'm not going to lie. Um, um, it was, it was just, it, it was out of my depth. And I think the the manager had saw that. They thought, I'll give him another day. You know, yeah. I'll, I, maybe it was just a bad day. First day and, nerves. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, after the second day, Darren, he just pulled me to one side and he just said, look, Lou, probably you're, you're, you're feeling this as well. It, this, this is a bit out of your depth, um, yeah. son. You know, obviously you've, you, I can see your efforts there, but this level is just not for you. And, you know, we're not, we won't be considering you for, for a position in the team. So that was that. And uh, basically I just, I, I understood. I weren't like going, oh, you know, I failed right. or anything. And then I uh, decided, well, there's only one one other option. So I went up to Bury, um, and they had seen me for a week. They like they liked me. And basically I started living up there, but I wasn't getting paid any money. So basically for, I mean, a YTS is, I mean, it's football season about nine, 10 months. So mm-hmm. I had gone up there like four months into the season. I was basically playing and just going up there, not only for free because I wasn't getting paid anything, but my dad was actually paying for my digs. So I was living with a family, 20 pounds, 20 pounds a night. And I was staying there five nights a week. So work the maths out, it's 400 pounds a month. So he was paying that on top and the train fares because I was getting a train back home. I had a rail card. So again, it's just, yeah. just to give you context, it's a lot. Um, but again, my dad, he wanted, he wanted the best for me. And I think this is so important to help people to recognise that in sport, you think it's all easy, but without the backing and the support of your family, it's really hard, isn't it, to make it, to even get your foot in the door of becoming a professional. And and yet everybody sees the glamorous side of when people have made it, like their overnight successes, but the hard work and the struggle that goes on in the background with, with families. And like you've just explained there, you're going from one club where you were essentially bullied to another one that was like totally out of your depth 
to a third one, which means that all of the clubs are so, so different. And you're not prepared for that either. It's, you know, all of this is new. And thank goodness that you did have a supportive family who were able to, to you know, help you out financially, as well as obviously from a, a moral standpoint and to support you on that. Because obviously without your dad's contacts, it might have been even more of a challenge. So there you are, footballing for free. <laughs> but, yeah. but did you feel more at home there? So I did initially, like the manager at the time, Richard Barker. So anybody in the footballing world or, or knows of Richard Barker, who was a player at Mansfield Town. But anyway, he's now the assistant manager at Derby County, actually, <laughs> would you believe? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he, he was such a nice guy. And I liked him a lot. He liked me. He liked my work ethics. He, he was a hard worker in his day. So he, he, re he actually really respected that. But this is the thing. I know this sounds really cliche in a way, but it's, it's a bad thing is that obviously once I got to the end of the season, he he looked at the budget and basically they, they did have space. But the, the physio at the time really liked me. He was like, this guy works hard. Like, give him a chance. And anyway, they gave me a chance and I couldn't believe it. I was like made up. I was like, oh, my gosh, like this whole season, like five months of just doing all this. And then I got that break. Yeah. Then... When I had signed pen to paper for a two year thing, so again, money wise, you're talking 60, I think it was like 63 pound a week or something, 65 pound a week. Um, so again, not it's not about the money, yeah. it's about the vision of what you want for your future, right? Yeah, um, the manager, the new manager came in, didn't like me. No, deja so, vu almost. So, yeah, so he came in and he was very, it was this guy, you know, we all did an initiation, like. And I'm talking, when I say initiation, he came in, it was very weird. I mean, Nor Northern Irish guy. And we had to stand up in the change rooms. And he was like, you had to stand up, say your name, your favourite song, your favourite sex position, and then do a bit of a dance. Weird. Yeah, it was just different. I mean, yeah. whatever. Right. Like, all, all about, yeah, all about having a bit of fun. But I was just like, okay, whatever. So we all did that. A bit out of the comfort zone. And then he just said it then. Look, look boys, us, you've all kind of like really got into this exercise. Appreciate it a lot. Just so you know. I'm always going to leave my office door open. If you ever want to talk to me about anything, you can. Right. So there's me going, oh, my God, wow, this is amazing. Like, this guy's this guy's going to open the door. If I've ever got a concern, question, because obviously yeah. I like asking questions. I like to know where things are at and reasons yeah. why people do things, especially as managers. If you're going to make a decision, I, I want to know the reason why. I don't want it to just be like, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, I said so. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, I, yeah, and, and obviously I hate getting told what to do anyway. I don't know about <laughs> you, but it's just, you, you know, you want to have a bit of a, a reasoning. So... Mm -hmm. You know, to, to cut the, the long story short, I, I started having it where, I d you know, I went into his office and stuff and I do I was doing a lot of work outside of football as well, Vicky. So I had a personal trainer. Um, I, had, I hired multiple people um, that, my, again, my dad was funding for to, to give me the edge. I wanted to be the best. Right. You were literally uh, living it, sleeping it, breathing it. Even in your spare time, you were working on everything. Yeah honestly everything and what started to happen was is that in this environment again it's very competitive if you're not in the starting 11 if you're not getting picked week in week out there's a divide already in the change room right right so what i'm talking about if you're a bench warmer you kind of clue up together like you you you, you, you like the bench warmer together people yeah right yeah. if you if you're like the starting 11 you're the starting 11 and then if you go into the first team reserve team obviously you start becoming this like person that can glow and stuff like that, which whatever like for me it was just I just kept my head down I tried to focus hard and really what happened was is when we got to the end of the season I was like I really want to take this up a notch so what I did was is I, I wanted to again have the edge hide a personal trainer at home I was working with another lad who were playing professional football at the time or in a professional environment we did training together so I've come back and I had a bit of confidence in me like thinking you know what I've done the work here I'm, I'm excited for this new season because I've really put the shift in so yeah. obviously in pre-season, we did a lot of running and uh, we had like heart rate monitors on. We did all these like testings and stuff like that. I was at the back. No. Couldn't believe it. I was at the back. I, it was so all of this hard work and training and my dad had invested over a thousand pounds and it was just not specific to football because it was in a gym and, and obviously we was out on the grass. Mm. So so obviously for me, I didn't know anything different. I just thought I was getting strong, lifting weights building this physique because obviously I had a bit of insecurity about my physique yeah. and yeah. Um, I'll never forget going to that PT and showing him a picture of Cristiano Ronaldo and be like I want to look like this guy <laughs> right. in six weeks right you know as you um, do as you do so yeah I, I went back in and, and that was the that was like really my low but this is when I fell into depression Vicky because I felt like no matter how hard I tried I felt like the world was against me 
and mm. that was it and and i fell into this very self-destructive mindset and what happened was that because obviously i wasn't like in this fitness and everybody knew about i had a trainer mm. the thing is they brought in a sports scientist to mm. a strength and development coach to basically work on the guy's strength physicality extra fitness so he was buzzing he got he got really excited the fact that he could actually do some extra running with the lads and i was in that group so i did all the running all training and I had to do extra running and i was in this group and that again caused that divide i was it's like i was a loser right. because yeah there was a couple of us because because obviously you're doing the extra stuff and it's like yeah you're not fit enough you must be crap mm -hmm. basically it almost reminds me of, of back in the days when i went to school and there were there were kids who you had to stay behind for extra reading after school because they were the ones who were struggling to keep up in lessons and it sounds like it's the same sort of thing no it that that's yeah pretty much yeah. it so what does that lead to so you already feel down anyway in the session you're spending yeah. a lot of time with these boys i mean we're talking yeah. you, you're getting through the doors half past eight you haven't say breakfast together or maybe you've had breakfast at home and then you're there till half past four or five o'clock wow it's a long Those day. days and, and again, just to give you a bit of an insight to what I did in my scholarship, because this don't even happen now. It doesn't because there's people who get hired for this job and it's just all clean and it's all done for you. Like everything's done for you. But when I was a, a YTS, this again was a really grounding experience is that, yeah, we, we did football. Because everyone's like, what do you do? Just play football all day. No, we actually did a lot of cleaning. And would you believe? So with the first team, we had to ensure that their bottles were clean. We had to pump up the ball. To a set pressure gauge it had to be it had to be right. so specific Bang on. um we, we had to clean the football boots we had mm -hmm. to uh, mop the floors empty the bins make the gaffer and the assistants cups of teas in the morning so we take turns on that we, for the first team games we'd roll out a mat we'd be ball boys so we'd sit by the side you know all this kind of stuff we'd have to before we started training we'd have to set the first team up so we had to settle their pitch with the poles Wow. Nets. So the nets weren't made up. So we literally had to clip in all the nets and then go and set up our nets, then take our nets down, then take their nets down. And we had to walk half a mile to the football ground. Jeez. So, so we're carrying everything on our shoulders. So yeah, it was It's a lot it, of graft. It was it was graft, yeah. Again, yeah. graft for little return, you know. Yeah. It was you know, you think to yourself, gosh, you must be again bringing it in. And then with that as well, we was going to the Berry College and the college that we was at. A lot of people saw it as, oh, look at these footballers, look at all these prima donnas. They think they, they can just snake around and do all this. And it's like, you know, I was like thinking, it's really not that, you know, yeah. it's not that fancy. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like, obviously, in academies now. Like, in, I, I guess, obviously, at the time, you know, Berry was like League Two and they didn't really have much money. But I had taken so much away from it in regards to respect and just doing the work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as I said to you right at the beginning, it was just a really tough, like, three years. I'd right. never experienced that. I'd gone from being on such a high, being the top player, always going up levels and then getting offered this contract. And, and it's just not and working then, out. Yeah. And then, yeah, hitting rock bottom. And then I guess really at 19, I, I got rejected. And, and that was, that's something I taught today not to go like straight into the coaching side of things but the, the three things that i always faced as a bit of a a, a bug or a problem and pain that, that i always felt was self-rejection mm -hmm. um i didn't so self-rejection i was also a workaholic I, I became a workaholic in the coaching field as a result of being rejected because i felt like oh i can do this look at me look at me i'll prove a point to myself that i can do this and also self-belief because i lost all that belief that like well What's the point? I, I can't be a footballer and I put so much into it. I think for the people listening, when you said you went into a depression, this is a word that I think has changed meaning over the last few years. And it kind of gets thrown around, doesn't it? When people say, oh, they had a bad day. Oh, I was so depressed. I didn't get the I didn't get the exam results I wanted. Or oh, I'm so depressed. This didn't work out right. And what they don't mean that at all. They mean something completely different. But you're talking about real depths of of low depression. Can you just can you elaborate on what that what that manifested like for you on a day to day basis? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Not a problem. So Okay, so I'll give context. I had no sexual intercourse for nine months. I didn't even have... I know this sounds a bit, you know, 
maybe too much. I don't know how raw you want mm -hmm. it to be, but I just didn't, I didn't even have any, any sort of ejac no libido ejaculation, anything. I just, I, I, I completely fell into a, I, I didn't even go out and socialize. I wouldn't say I locked myself in the room. I think I'm not going to say that because I didn't, because I would go, I would go out and do stuff, but I very rarely had social interaction with many other people unless it was in the gym because that's that was my church that was my holy grail place where i just felt free right. everywhere else i felt trapped um i had therapy in football so i seeked out a few therapists um didn't really work for me if i'm being honest mm -hmm. it was great for to offload and feel a little bit weight lifted but yeah it didn't really work but i think for me it was just the fact that i i was putting all my energy into just trying to keep up with what pro footballers were doing. So I'd read books, I'd do extra training. I was doing double sessions a day. I was just, that was it. That was my life. And then I got very obsessed with nutrition. So nice. I think the depression was obviously from a mental standpoint, but also a physical standpoint to the point mm -hmm. where I literally, I starved myself. Um, mm -hmm. I got obsessed with body fat and this, this again, going on to the football inside, they, they did testings where the, the lean body mass and all this kind of stuff, which yeah. I'm, obviously you'll know about in in the field as well. Yeah. And um, the but they had the body fat calipers, and that for me just it tipped me over the edge because it was very intrusive. And again, you know what I'm like if I'm hiding my body and then someone's pinching it. Yeah, I'm, literally I'm like, grabbing folds of skin and, yeah. and nipping it with a caliper. It's it's very very, as you say, intrusive and and uncomfortable and in, unless the person is really skilled at it it's hit and miss when you do, do it next time are they getting you in the same place you don't know and so you can get vast results or differences in results which can often result in what you just said you deciding the the best way to handle it was to change how you looked and change your shape and externally try and focus on that so that you could internally feel better about yourself yeah and that that was it it was it was yeah. all it was all I was focused so much though on yeah like the external I wasn't working mm -hmm. on the internal first so mm -hmm. as as I started doing as I worked harder and harder I did more training so I overtrained then what happened was is my performance dipped as a result you know libido like I say yeah. then what started happening was is that the manager saw and he could pick up on it he was like brilliant he was like even he was like yeah that's great because he's not doing well anyway and obviously this mm -hmm. is this is proof this is data we're so obsessed with data and if I didn't hit a certain body fat marker, you're not in the starting 11. So again, it was like, wow, it was just so, so, so much pressure. And the reality was, is that my body fat was going up, even though I was obviously in a so-called calorie deficit, but mm -hmm. I was overworking the muscle, the muscle mass, everything was just deteriorating. And so what I would do, Vicky, is when I'd go home on the train, what did I do? I felt sorry for myself. I, I comfort ate. You ate, yeah. I just, I hit it hard. Yeah. yeah. And I think I'm just going to pick up on that because you're showing so much powerful stuff that I think people can resonate with this idea that if I want to drop more body fat, I train harder, I do more. And yet it's actually it's a boomerang effect. You don't get the body fat loss because your body hangs on to it even more because you're creating a stress response. And when that stress response is in, the last thing your body's going to do is drop body fat because it needs to focus on, on getting you back down and your nervous system back down. But then when you've got these stress hormones flying around all over the place, it depletes your neurotransmitters. And if we turn to food, then you actually do genuinely feel better. And you end up in this crazy cycle of punishing yourself with more exercise because you overate. And then you're trying to get the body fat down and it's not, it's going up. So you're going to oh, go at it harder. Then you eat more food and that's the cycle that I think a lot of disordered eaters and eating disorder people, because they are different, can can kind of look at. And so for you, knowing that you were doing that and it wasn't making any difference, that in itself is depressing, isn't it? Yeah, it just felt like somebody was smacking me in the face or yeah. winding, you know, winding me every time, giving me a kick in the balls because the the work ethic was never a problem. But maybe, you know, if, if someone's to have a camera and follow me around whilst I was playing or following me around outside of football. Probably I looked exhausted. I looked gaunt. You know, I didn't look healthy. I was malnourished. And, you know, the the, the way that, and, and my mum and dad didn't even know this anyway until I told them, but I was insured on their car. And as soon as I'd go home, and once I had my little bit of a an overeating episode, if you want to call it, mm -hmm. on the way home on the train from Manchester to Alfreton, I'd go in my mum's car, drive to Tesco and sit in the car and buy loads of cookies, mm -hmm. eclairs. And I'd just sit to the point where my legs felt so heavy, full of sugar and blood 
you know, that, that I just, I physically couldn't breathe because I'd ate that much. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, and just to fast forward, I had a very similar experience of me falling back into that when I'd done a photo shoot. So as you can just, just to like marry the both up, you know, I said about, I wanted to have, you know, a six pack or, or feel better in my body. I'd done that through a photo shoot with right. my biz, with my coaching business, just to kind of, I guess, see if I could get in my best shape, did it. Obviously it weren't sustainable. Yeah. Then as soon as that kind of like ended, I was like, Oh, what next? But then I was like, Oh my God, I can now have, cause I was heavily restricted. I was like, Oh, now I can have what I want. So literally before I even had the photo shoot, I had 12 donuts in the back of my car, smashed eight. Ready. After, ready to go. Yeah. Then I, again, I got to the point where I ate myself to the point where I couldn't breathe. And guess what? I was just spewing up all night. Yeah. And I think so many men and women can relate to that, but feel that it's something that's horrific. It's shameful. It's not something that they want to share in public because what will you think? But I, I'm certain that a lot of people listening will be going, yep, yep, I've done that. And this is what you've described there is that boomerang effect and why dieting and restricting excessively is never sustainable. And you are going to boomerang because your body's not daft. <laughs> it's going, OK, yeah, it literally is like when you take an elastic band, it's, it can only stretch so far and then it's going to break. And, and that's when your body just goes, right, give it me all. But that then changes how you look at food, doesn't it? And how you look at yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, just what you shared there about the boomerang and just not maintaining, just feeling like I'm, yeah, yo-yoing, boomeranging, mm -hmm. going back and forth. If I'm being really honest and, you know, I, I, look, I've been in it. Well, I say now I've moved more in line with my coaching business. But when I was on the gym floor, I mean, I've been in the coaching industry now for eight years. Right. It had taken me six years out of those eight years to actually finally feel a sense of I'm in control. I've got this. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's so important for people to hear because it's not an overnight job, is it? You've got to do a lot of, of the inside work and it's a hard environment to be in. To, to be on that gym floor, but you'd had a good grounding with, with all of the work that you and all of the cleaning that you had to do. Yeah. Um, because it's part and parcel of, of that whole world. But you're kind of surrounded by mirrors and you're surrounded by other people who are talking to you about how they want to look and body fat percentages. So you're never going to get away from it, are you? No, you're not. And I think just on the, the gym floor situation and just being out there, that was, my, I mean, obviously I've been on cruise ships as well and traveled the world. That was a nice little space for me to find myself again and not feel judged or nobody knew who I was. So I could actually be myself. I didn't feel like I'm trying to put on a front for anybody like, oh, I'm this footballer. Nobody knew I played football. So that's always good. Yeah. Even though when, when we had a five side session, they could tell I played. But <laughs> um, yeah, just when I was on the gym floor, what, what changed really for me was people was asking me, asking me questions. Yeah. So I was normally the question guy. So that right. instantly made, oh my gosh, people actually want to hear me out. They want to listen to me. Amazing. Because I'd not been used, because nobody went, oh, Luke, you ask too many questions. So that changed. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing as well is that I actually start getting paid pretty well for it. So I was like thinking, oh, wow. You know, because I'd been used to what I'd been, you know, given in the footballing days. And I started mm -hmm. thinking, wow. But then my issues started to become where, I like to say became this workaholic, self-proclaimed, you know, and I enjoyed it. It wasn't that I was like going, maybe I need to slow down a little bit. I just was, yeah, I want to tell people. I was like, I've been so trapped inside of this identity where, you know, I was depressed, I, you know, to let football go. Oh, it was, it was the hardest decision I ever made in my life. To what just happened then on that? Just to just take us back. So you were struggling, you were, you were having to meet all of these, you know, body fat kind of rules and what have you. And you were just striving and working hard the whole time. So tell us, tell us how it, how it panned out. So really from it all, I just, I started to kind of pull myself away because I, I, the, the, the input and the effort that I was putting in, it wasn't really kind of reciprocated. Mm -hmm. So I guess I hit the effort button, really. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't let myself go, but I just kind of like hung my boots up in, in that environment. And obviously I, mm -hmm. I knew from as soon as that manager signed up, I know it sounds really bad, but I was like, I really am going to struggle here unless a new manager comes. I was hoping for a new manager to come in and never happened. And the other thing as well is financially the club, I didn't know 
how bad financially they was in, like the position they was in. So right. again, it, and the thing is, is when you leave, you do have opportunities to go abroad, like America and stuff like that. But I think mm. re- really what what happened to me was is that it, I, I left it. I left that club at nineteen years old, depressed. Right. And I was like, what do I do? And then this is where I went absolutely balls to the wall on self development again. So I hired mm. I hired a free kick specialist. Wow. I hired because I, I love free kicks. So it, it's mad, isn't it, that you can have all these people that are out there. Free kick specialist. I hired a power development coach who'd been at X Man United. You know, he'd worked with Ronaldo's gigs. I I had a session with Roy Keane. Um, You know, I had a boxing session. Yeah, I I, I got booked with some fantastic people. I've met some great people. I still talk to some of them today. And they always said, Luke, you know, you deserve a break, son. You know, you're a great lad. You know, they they all put the arm around me. I was like, oh, well, I wish it could, you know, I like this here, but I want this everywhere in my life, you know, and, yeah. and uh, I just struggled to find those people. Right. Uh, even that, and, and that was a part of my life from 19 to 21. I worked with my dad part time. So I said to my dad, look, I don't want you to fund me anymore. I want it to be where maybe there's a trade off. I work for you. And by the way, I hated engineering because um, <laughs> it's his business. I work for him, clocked up the hours, earned the money, which then allowed me to drive in a Peugeot 106 up to Manchester three times a week to pay this guy 70 pound an hour, wow. um, you know, for, for his services, but be around these top athletes, like not even in football, some are in tennis, some are Taekwondo GB athletes. And that for me was worth the time. That was worth the sacrifice to just be a... Now what that opened doors for me was, is that, you know, I had an agent. I mean, I could talk to you forever, Vicky, about what's gone on in my life, but the reality is, is that I was always an opportunist. I, I always looked at opportunity as an optimist. And the other thing as well is I said yes to a lot of things. Now, I'm not saying saying yes is, is the... Is that Panacea. The no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not because obviously you want to be able to say no to things because there's power in that. But I guess for me, I just, at this point in my life, I had to be open-minded. Yeah. You know, but, but what you've just shared there in and of itself is really powerful because you recognised without putting in any more time and effort that you were in effect, flogging a dead horse, as it were, and you were wise enough at that young age to to, to step a, a step back and just go, actually, I thought this is what I wanted. It's not turning out to be like I hoped or expected. So rather than me pursuing something that is no longer making me happy, let me look at a way of doing it differently. And so that just that in itself to be able to do that shows a massive amount of awareness on your behalf and you did say that you were quite a mature person for your age and that just shows that level of maturity because you could have carried on struggling and beating yourself up even though you were not feeling great and potentially weren't looking great you could have continued to do that probably for another year two years if you if you thought that that was the right thing to do couldn't you but you didn't no no I I appreciate that as well and I have. I've always had a, a good head on my shoulders in terms of conversation. I was never scared to just rock up in a room or changing room full of strangers and be there and be like, right, you know, this is it. This is my opportunity. I take it with both hands and yeah. be open minded yeah. to see where it took us. And and that's where my life was. I, I mean, look, I mean, even from the ages of 19 to 21, I, I had a spell out in Madrid. I was playing Spanish football. I was working in a bilingual school, earning wow. a thousand, earning a thousand euros a month, right, and four hundred euros a month for accommodation. So I only had six hundred euros a month spare to have a bit of fun. So, I, but, it, but you know, I was used to it. I was like, well, you know, I've only been used to getting paid six to five pound a week. So the money was never a thing. It was more about the vision. It's more about like, I want to be this footballer. Um, then I'd, I'd been in Scotland. I tried Scottish football. I, look, I I really did try. I had a football agent. It conned me as well. I had a football agent con me for money. Um, so, you know, it's, it, there's highs and lows, but it's definitely shaped me. I mean, we always say this, you know, your experiences shape you. And what that actually got to me was like, look, I personally feel that probably football, and this, this was at like 22 years old. This is when I hung my boots up. This is when right. I've decided football's done. Like I'm, I'm gone. I'm out. I'm checking mm-hmm. out. I don't want to do it anymore. Now I wasn't somebody that hit the drugs, the alcohol. I just hit the gym. You know, I, I, that yeah. was my, that was my addiction. Right which I know, you, you know, you, you've had a similar thing with like the training side of things. Um, so obviously my dad, my mum and dad, they were traveling and that's when they saw guys out on cruise ships. And it was like, oh, there's a fitness trainer there because there's gyms on a cruise ship. And I'd never been on one. 
I was like, what? People actually train when they're on holiday, don't they just eat all the food? Obviously, they eat all the food, but then they go in the gym. They train, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that led me down there, and then that's when I took took on my personal training qualification, and then that's when mm -hmm. that kind of opened up that door. But what was really fast-paced was that I didn't really have much space to breathe and be on a gym floor and gain any. I didn't gain any PT experience. I literally just signed. and not like I went to this academy it's called Steiner in London, but yeah. Watford. And literally, I had three weeks. I was learning Pilates, yoga, boot camp. Brilliant. Um, I was teaching seminars. So I had to stand up in front of people with a whiteboard pen and deliver a health seminar, like how to increase your metabolism, how to burn body fat and all this kind of stuff. I, like, I know this stuff because I fucking hell, I failed myself in a way, but I've learned from my own experiences. <laughs> so I was like, oh, great. And then before I know it, I'm I'm packing my bags for nine months and I'm flying out to Vancouver. Amazing. Amazing. But And this is where, because you were open to just having a go, and there's nothing like getting thrown in at the deep end, is there? To just go, right, okay, I'm doing this and just follow through. But that's that's what you've done all the way through. And so now, so you've had the experience in the gym and, and you've got your coaching company now. But your master your life is, is something that you need, your face just lit up then when I said that. So this is obviously because of all of this that you've been through. This is something that you're really getting your teeth into. And it's just, again, I can see that it's about passion, isn't it? It's about you following your passion. So tell us about that. Yeah. So I think really the question that I'd ask, obviously, the audience to answer for themselves is what does mastering your life mean to you? Yeah. And what question. does it mean to you? Because there's no right or wrong here. Like for me, mastering your life for me is about connection with your own identity so you feel like spiritually in a way, if you want to say it, but also at the same time, it's being able to have relationships that are closest to you, but actually sharing experience. So my love language, right? People will say what makes you happy, love, joy, peace, all that kind of stuff. For me, it's love. It's like my, my love language is active service. So I'm in a service industry. I want to give back to people. Even if I feel like the world's not given to me, I will still continue to give. So Mastering Your Life is a program that brings individuals, whether they, they can be high performers in maybe certain areas of their life, but maybe they want to become a high performer across the board. Right. If they're not a high performer and maybe they're in a place where they're probably not where they want to be, maybe they're in a negative circle, maybe they feel like no matter what they try and do, they're always having resistance and roadblocks and people pulling them back to where they are. I'm creating a community. I think communities is something that I'm always passionate about. I want to get great people in a room yeah okay it's an investment it's not cheap it will never be cheap if you want to be in that best room right exactly yeah but the, but the, the thing you've got to ask yourself is what's the cost of not being in that room you know right. what what's the cost of you being in exactly the same place it may not have a money sign over the top of you but it will cost you time it will cost you energy and the cost of opportunity that was staring at you you could put a mirror in front of your face and you would look at yourself in the mirror and go what do I need? What do I need to do in order for myself to be happy, fulfilled, and live in alignment with a life that's true to myself? And I guarantee you, people know the answer. But are they doing it? Probably not. Why? Because they're just making up a story inside of their head. So for me, it's like let's coach these people on a depth. Let's bring an experience to the table, and let's help them master their life. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely love it. So if people are going, oh my god, I want a bit of that. <laughs> how do they find out more about it? And how do they connect with you? Where are you hanging out? Oh, well, I mean, everywhere, pretty much. Uh, I would definitely say I'm a, I'm a social media bunny, really. I bounce everywhere. But just put in, like, Luke Beastall. It'll come up as, like, Muscle Coach UK or Master Your Life. I mean, the website is Master Your Life. If you just put that in on Google search, you'll pretty much come up with it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, and, it, and it just ties in with what we said. Yeah. So I will put all of the links, folks, in the show notes. And if you're watching on YouTube, it will be in the description. So you'll just be able to click on those links and it will take you straight there. Luke. It's been an absolute joy. And I really do want to say thank you for being so open and sharing about your feelings and just the whole kind of behind the scenes world that people may be surprised to hear about. Because as you say, we've got this kind of glamorous image of professional football and that it's that it's all just like done for you and everything's fantastic. And you painted a very, very different picture of the challenges that young people particularly can have so i want to ask you now do you still play football and do you still enjoy it uh i actually tied up my boots two weeks ago for the first time in 18 months um, right. did i enjoy it 
Yes and no. I say yes because it was, I always feel free when I step over that white line. I'll tell you why. Because obviously my phone's heavily, well, my phone. I say my head is heavily my phone with social media, business, all that kind of stuff. So you can't have a watch buzzing. It, 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 it's, it's impossible. For 90 minutes, you are literally in that pitch and you're present, right? That's that's so powerful mm -hmm. in itself. The yeah. no part is, I, I really hate to say this, but they're just not my people. Right. It's amazing, isn't it? So from you growing up as a little boy, being completely obsessed with it, now it's kind of like, yeah, take it or leave it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I've tried. I, honestly, Vicky, I've tried to go in with the mindset of like, Luke, just go back to enjoying it. But that competitive edge, because it's in my business and it's in helping people. It's, it's, it's not just, in that. It, it's just Let's not in. It. Yeah. So, so it's, I'll, I will, I will definitely say I will play from time to time, but it's never going to be a regular thing. Yeah. Brill absolutely brilliant. Thank you for that. Have you got anything that you would like to share, uh, whether it's a saying or something that you just want to maybe pose a question to, to leave our, our listeners and our watchers with before we say goodbye? Ooh, okay. Um, that's a good question. I think really just take a bit of a checking point with yourself right now in this moment with no distraction, no noise, just silence for two minutes. Just sit with a pen and piece of paper and ask yourself, what do I actually want from my life whilst I'm here? Wow. Brilliant. And, I, and, I, and just free flow it. No pressure. Just write. And, if, you know, if you write one word, like what, what, what one word comes to your mind? Is it happiness? Is it financial? Free? Whatever it is. Just I think that is what nobody does because we're so fast paced we are so chaotic it's like we will sleep right to the minute that we have we'll snooze our alarm about 10 times then we get out the door we rush coffee you know it's all rush 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 chaotic 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 so yeah, yeah take a moment for yourself and then see what comes up there you go that's a challenge for you folks and uh, we would both love you to put some comments um and let us know what you actually discovered. Please do connect with Luke, folks. Use the links. Um, just check out what he is doing because he's got so many other things on his podcast and all sorts for you to for you to discover. So I just want to say one more time, Luke, thank you so much for joining us. And to those of you watching or listening, if you have found this really helpful, please don't forget, hit that like button and do share it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so that you get notified of the next up and coming episode. And I am going to leave you with my usual little saying, folks. We only have one life, as far as we know, and one body. Please look after it because it is looking after you. Until next week, take care. Bye-bye.